And so with the spin orbit coupling and how we label the lines, uh, it, it's played a huge role in how we understand the universe. And I mean, long ago when we started looking through telescopes, uh, it, we weren't satisfied just seeing a bunch of little bright dots in the sky. You ever done, you know, gone and seen a telescope? It's kind of let you down a little bit, or let me down. I, I looked through it and and you see a bright dot that's bigger than when you look with your regular eye. <laughs> and, you know, I know astronomers are probably like just cringe when they hear that, but I, I never was really that excited about astronomy. And then I got to take the school's telescope home one Christmas break or whatever. The teacher said, yeah, you know, nobody ever uses this thing. If you want to set it up in your backyard over Christmas break, you can do that. And I discovered the planets. Okay, so then I found Jupiter and I saw the moons. And for some reason that was really cool because I saw this bright dot with my eye and I look through it and you see a bright dot with four little dots. <laughs> and so you can see the moons of Jupiter and then it saw a little fuzzy dot and I looked at that one and it was Saturn and you could see the little rings and the little planet in the middle. Little, it's a gas giant, but you know, through my telescope, it was small. Um, and so that was pretty cool. I liked that a lot because there was actually something to the, the smudge in the sky. Um, but then I really got excited as I'm studying physical chemistry and looking at atomic spectroscopy to learn that they put spectrometers on telescopes. And so and then you're getting this spectra, the like atomic spectra of stars. And that is really cool if you think about it. This is a, you know, a star many, many thousands and millions of light years away and you're looking at the chemical composition of it. That's crazy. I mean, in the lab, when you want to get a chemical composition of something using a UV vis spectrometer, you got to actually go get the sample, put it in a cuvette and stick it in the beam. And here we're able to do spectroscopy on something that's millions of years away. Now that's pretty cool. And we can look at it. So I don't really have a, a high powered, I don't have any telescope actually. I used to have a little tiny one when I was in high school, but we do have our sun, which is uh, eight light minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's kind of brings your brain a little bit too. The sun, the light you see from the sun is eight minutes old. That's how long it took light to travel to your eye is eight minutes. So we always, this is sort of an aside, we always want, I always wondered if the sun just disappeared, would we know immediately or would it take eight minutes for gravity to disappear? You know, like the gravity of the sun, like would it be immediate or would it take eight minutes? Because does gravity travel at the speed of light or not? And so now we've answered that question just a couple of years ago, this um, light interferometric, uh, let's see, gravitational observatory. So they made interferometers, which you know about an interferometer now, because we did that in the spectroscopy chapter, um, where you have two light paths and they put a laser through that and they get on that center burst where they can see that the paths are exactly the same and they built several of these in concrete all around the globe. And if a gravity wave comes through, it will change the length of one of those paths from the length of the other. So they just built these interferometers and coupled them together electronically and wait. <laughs> okay. And so they just keep collecting data to see if the light, if the path lengths of either one of these mirrors ever changes. And sure enough, they had a collision of two black holes that were oscillating around each other. And so they were sending out these gravity waves and then when they collided, they became one object and that created this huge gravity wave that went through the universe. And when it went through planet Earth, we saw the LIGO on one end of the planet change dimension and then we saw LIGO on the other end of the planet change dimension. So the whole planet was our path link of this experiment. And they were able to say, yeah, it passed through Earth at the speed of light. So now we know the gravity travels at the speed of light, whatever gravity waves are, okay? Don't know that, but but still, that's that's the way gravity's propagated. So now my answers, my question's answered. If the sun just disappeared, that we would, wouldn't know for eight minutes, okay? So even light, light and gravity would get here at the same time and, and uh, it would just be instantaneously this destruction, instantaneous destruction. So. What I wanted to do was take a spectrum of our sun. We've taken spectroscopy of lots of things. And so I took our ocean optic spectrometer, the fiber optic one, and I, you know, it's not good to just stare at the sun, right? So I just stuck this thing kind of obliquely at the sun. I didn't 
stick it straight to the sun and burn up my detector. But this is the spectrum that I got. So what do we see? Well, we see the black body radiation curve, right? It's this nice, smooth curve. I could take that curve and I could calculate the temperature, the apparent temperature of the sun. What I would be getting is the sort of what we call, it's not really a surface temperature, but for lack of a better word, that's what we call it. It's the outer temperature of the sun. There's no hard surface of the sun. There's sort of a, a, a light horizon where the outermost excited atoms are all emitting light and that's what we see. Um, it looks, you know, like a big ball, but it's a big ball of really dense gas colliding with itself. And and so that that outer edge where the temperature drops out of the visible region, that's what appears to us as the surface of the sun. So that light coming off the surface of the sun has a particular black body temperature, and that's what gives us this curve. So these are the wavelengths that are emitted in that proportion. Based on that Planck distribution, we could see what the temperature of that outermost part of the sun is. It's very hot. And then notice these dips. <clears throat> so these dips are called the Fraunhofer lines. They're dark lines in the solar spectrum. So what, what do you think we're looking at? Why would light be missing at specific <coughs> spots in the spectrum? Because this light coming off the sun is a continuum. It's that black body radiation. So we have all wavelengths of light and in that that black body proportionality. So there's just, you know, it's a gradual change, but these real specific absorptions are coming from either molecules or atoms. What are we looking at? Like, think about the path that this light took. And there's some missing light. And so just like in a spectrometer, your detector is here, your source is here. If you want to measure the absorption of your sample, you put it between the source and the detector. So what's between the source, the sun, and my detector here on Earth? Atmosphere. Our atmosphere, okay? And sure enough, we see oxygen. So oxygen is absorbing some of this light. So these A and B lines here are oxygen, and they're the largest lines. <clears throat> we also see some hydrogen lines, which are, I mean, I guess that's kind of strange, but we have, I guess we have hydrogen on Earth. Hydrogen's a gas. It's not unreasonable that hydrogen would be in the atmosphere, okay? But this is weird. Look at this, sodium and iron. What is that? How much sodium is in our atmosphere? You wouldn't think there'd be very much, would you? An iron? <laughs> I mean, I know we have a lot of iron on planet Earth, but is it in the atmosphere? Where do you think the iron is? Huh? In space. Okay, so it could be between the sun and us. All right. It's a pretty heavy element, and so it, gravity is going to work on iron and everything else. So where do you think the, the iron in space is close to? In it's closer to the sun than just in general space. So the sun has an atmosphere too. And so the iron is in space, but it's been blown out of the sun. So here's the sun. And <clears throat> all of these little lines, you see these, these little corona discharges? That is, those are elements being blown out of the sun. <laughs> The reason we don't see them is they're not hot enough to emit light. They're not excited enough, but they're there. So we have an atmosphere around the sun of elements that have been blown out of the sun. Now, what powers the sun is its enormous mass, and that's pulling all of the elements together. And they, they, they get so hot and dense from the collisions and gravity that they start to fuse. 
So the repulsion of the nuclei eventually is overcome and you actually get fusion. Now you need an enormous amount of matter to do that, okay? Oh, if you look through something like the Hubble or the new Webb Space Telescope, you'll see dust clouds in space. And those are um, remnants of stars that got so dense that they then exploded and just dispersed all of the elements into space. Well, they're attracted to each other very slowly. will come back together and you get enough of them together. The ones in the middle can't seem to escape. Everywhere they go, they're colliding into other atoms. And as everything gets closer and closer because of gravity, eventually those inner atoms start to fuse. And when they fuse, then that gives off an enormous amount of energy. So fusion gives off, and we'll, if you stay with us all the way through thermodynamics, the last section in thermodynamics is nuclear radiochemistry. We talk about the amount of energy in the nucleus. And when you, when you split an atom, you stabilize the nucleus if it's greater than iron. And then when you fuse an atom that's less than iron, you get a lot of energy. So the binding energy is not a linear function. It kind of matches, maxes out at iron. So if you have light elements and they fuse together, they, they relax. So the, the fused nucleus is much lower in energy than the individual atoms. So if you take two hydrogen nuclei and you get them going fast enough that they, they overcome the repulsion and they hit, then they fuse, that drops an enormous amount of energy and that's given off in gamma rays and velocity. So they speed up and hit the, their neighbors with enormous force. And then that causes the neighbors to be able to overcome the, the nuclear repulsion and then they fuse. And that's what we call the process of the star lighting. So you have this mass that gets more and more dense, more and more dense, and then the star eventually will light and you have fusion. And once you have fusion, then it's a, it's a nuclear um, furnace. It's a, it's a, it's a nuclear factory <laughs> and you're fusing these elements and you're moving up the periodic table from hydrogen to helium and then helium and hydrogen merge to make lithium. And then you get a couple of heliums to merge and make lithium and some more neutrons and beryllium. And you just work your way up the periodic table as heavier and heavier elements fuse. It gets hotter and hotter and more dense. And then you get, you know, like a full blown star, like a, a small red star, like our sun. And it's constantly blowing some of those elements off the surface. So like in the inner part of the star, those elements can't escape, but in the outer part of the star, they can. And so they'll make their way out, but yet gravity kind of keeps them close by. And so the sun has an atmosphere that is in equilibrium with its composition. So we can take a spectrum of a star and see how much iron it has. Because iron is that most stable element and, and we can see how old the star is, how long it's been generating its nuclear furnace and so on. Now, if we were to take, um, say, a, uh, let's pick one that's easy, okay? So uh, find me, let's find 40. Okay, so zirconium and let's find 52. Where's 52? Uh, tellurium. Okay, so if in this star we have zirconium and tellurium and they smash together, that makes 92 and that's uranium. And so when the bigger elements smash together, then they make the even bigger elements. Okay, now that's not downhill thermodynamically, that's a little bit uphill. So uranium is not very stable and it will be radioactive naturally and work its way back down. But still, these bigger elements are just made by bigger nuclei smashing into each other. And so Making iron, it doesn't stop at iron. Some of the bigger nuclei will fuse to form the even bigger elements. Some of those, when you get past 82, are naturally radioactive. They're just too large. This nucleus is unstable. It starts to break apart. Okay. So this sun is emitting light. That's the source. Our eye or our spectrometer is the detector. It's going through two atmospheres. It's going through the solar atmosphere and it's going through Earth's atmosphere. Okay. Now, one way to test that theory is to put a telescope in space. <laughs> it's outside of our atmosphere, and so it's only seeing the stellar atmospheres. And, and we confirm this for sure. But we, we knew we can also look at um, sort of path length differences in our own atmosphere and see those peaks grow. So if we look at sunset, 
we're going through a lot more of our atmosphere than at noon. And so we could see those peaks grow that are related to our atmosphere and the ones related to the solar atmosphere don't grow. So we could do a path length experiment and know, okay, these lines are in our atmosphere and we see, okay, there's no iron in our atmosphere. There's really no hydrogen. That hydrogen is from the sun, the solar atmosphere, and there's really no, um, the sodium is not in our atmosphere. So this, all wavelengths of light coming out of the sun, we have a sodium atom there, which, which has cooled down. So it's in its ground state. So it's in that singlet S uh, one half state. Or, yeah, singlet S one half. Or no, singlet S zero. No, it was singlet S one half. And then a doublet S one half. And then the, that sodium line is absorbed by that ground state sodium. It goes up to the, to the uh, doublet P three halves and the doublet P one half uh, energy levels and it gives us that doublet spin orbit peak that we're used to seeing. And then we detect the light when it gets to Earth. So we're able to see the composition of the sun that's been blown out into the, the stellar atmosphere and, uh, and measure that with our spectrometers that are coupled to, um, to our various uh, telescopes. We can do this in all different regions of the spectrum and, and we get different images. So here's a galaxy that's been imaged in many different uh, um, you know, spectral wavelengths. And so a lot of times these composite images are composites of all of this data. And that's why we get so much interesting, so many interesting features. You know, you can see the little uh, brown looking, it, they kind of make it look with what you would think, you know, a dust cloud looks like. <laughs> it's a little brown and then some, some brighter light and then these uh, outer bands that are showing up in the UV and so on. So, uh, so this is uh, NGC 1512. Okay, who knows? Right, but that's, uh, they have different spectrometers associated with all these different uh, telescopes, and that's how we get our composite images. Okay. Um, it's, it's been colorized. Most of this uh, data is just in black and white, you know, so it's not very exciting to, to um, just pull the data down as an image, it's a black and white image, but then you get in and, uh, and they're not manipulating the location of the data, but they're manipulating the colors and blending the colors. So how do we understand this, this idea of the stars and, and cosmology? Okay, so this is the standard cosmology. I haven't read all of the blog posts, but there's apparently some, some modifications to this from the Webb telescope. Has anybody read any of the latest speculations on this? Anyway, up until now, this model has been pretty solid. Um, uh, some of the observations that have led to this model are what we're going to talk about today, the red shift of the light coming from other stars and so on, which shows this expansion of the universe. So this um, there's this expansion. You see that this uh, curve is coming out. Now, in order to picture a three-dimensional object in time, which is a fourth dimension, you really need a movie, okay? Um, I haven't seen a good movie of the universe, but I have seen this, and you'll see this too. So let me explain what's being shown here. In order to show the time dimension, we've deleted one of the spatial dimensions. And so every slice in time, our universe is represented by a disk. So going from left to right is time. And so we've just sort of taken out like X, Y, and Z coordinates. We just say taken out X. And so we're showing the whole universe as a disk, okay? And so this would be the today, this, this slice right here. If we run it backwards, we see that these real, really developed galaxies start to get less and less defined. We see that they're closer together because the universe was smaller at that point. And then we see this this region they call the Dark Ages, okay? This is the point where all the stars lit or the first stars lit. So the first stars lit about 400 million years after what they say is the Big Bang. Before those stars lit, you had uh, mass being gathered together. You had individual, you know, electrons and protons and so on forming the elements, okay? and then they were being attracted to each other by gravity. Then you had dense enough objects 
that we started fusion at that point. So that's when the first stars lit. This gap here is about 400 million years. So that's what it's talking about. So about 400 million years. Before that, you had this microwave uh, cosmic background. So cosmic, oops, looks like a B. So they have now mapped that. And what you see when you see this uh, cosmic uh, microwave background radiation map, you see blue regions and red regions. And it's, it's sort of a, a, a density map that's based on temperature. The microwave energy is so low that you could just talk about it in terms of a few different Kelvin using the Boltzmann distribution. So you could just look at that. You'll see the few, tech, few fluctuations. They say it's around 4 Kelvin. but it's not for Kelvin everywhere. It's got fluctuations. And what you're seeing is those tiny little temperature fluctuations um, are what they call the seeds of the galaxies. Those temperature fluctuations are what caused the matter to be cooler in some areas than other areas. And when it was cool, that was where it was able to condense and that's where the first stars formed. This is the thing that causes most of the physicists a little bit of heartburn is that it appears to be finely tuned. <clears throat> the same with this expansion rate also looks finely tuned. Okay. So fine tuning of the universe, when they talk about that, they mean that the, the amount of, uh, of positrons to, to uh, electrons, this matter-antimatter ratio, seems to be perfect for the universe that we have. You change that by one part and say 10 to the 70 and you don't have any stars. You don't have matter, you don't have chemistry. All you have was hydrogen maybe. You know, and so there's a lot of little variables that if you just changed them a little bit, you wouldn't have any of this. So that's the thing that, that seems um, too coincidental. The thing that really causes uh, me heartburn is this. This is a very, strange phenomenon. Faster than C, faster than the speed of light. I'll put two exclamation points on that. <laughs> <clears throat> so what appears to, you know, this model, one of the features of this model is that and that's why they called it a bang, a big bang, okay? The feature of this model is this initial inflation. It appears that the stars or this radiation was dispersed and finely tuned nearly instantaneously, okay? And, and then sort of the laws of physics kick in. So w what is this inflationary idea? You know, it's just that this matter and energy were placed into the universe, although smaller than it is today, and then it starts expanding from there. Okay. Now they've put quantum fluctuations here, but nobody knows that part. <laughs> so quantum fluctuations are, uh, let me show you the forward reaction before I show you the reverse reaction. Okay, so if you take an electron and a positron which is a positive electron, antimatter, and they come at each other, the matter and the antimatter cancel each other out and you get two gamma rays that leave. The gamma rays are simultaneously emitted. The mass is gone. So it's a conversion of mass to energy using Einstein's equation equals mc squared. So the mass disappears, you have two photons of energy. So this is really crazy, this is called annihilation. The mass is gone, which is bizarre, right? It's what you get with matter and antimatter. Sounds totally far-fetched. Do we have any modern day examples of this? 
Absolutely. Your aunt, your grandma, your mom or dad or somebody has probably gone to the hospital and gotten a PET scan. You've heard of PET scans? A positron emission tomography. The tomography is the geometry part. The computer maps things out. The positron emission is they put a positron emitter into their bloodstream. It's typically associated with a sugar molecule and cancer absorbs a lot of energy. And so that sugar is going to collect wherever the cancer is active. And then those positrons are going to come out of that emitter, find an electron, annihilate themselves, and two photons come out of their head. And the nice thing is it's simultaneous photons. So if your detector detects a signal that's not simultaneous with some other detector, then they throw it away. So it's a really low background technique, and you get a really high signal to noise and a super resolution image. So we use matter and antimatter. We know all about it, is my point. This isn't, you know, some science fiction idea. If you run this backwards, in other words, change the arrows, so now the gamma rays come together and hit, you can, for a small, very small period of time, create an electron-positron pair, which is mass. And the reason I put question marks on here is because I think this is being used in, inappropriately or illegitimately. This is saying that we're creating matter or mass out of nothing. And Lawrence Krauss, famous physicist, is going on and on about, he wrote a universe from nothing. And he's saying that <clears throat> matter comes out of nothing all the time. But does it? Where's the gamma ray come from? You have to have energy before you can do this reaction backwards, okay? And so I would say right here, I've got question marks there because from a physics or materialist point of view, we have no theory on that. And so they'll speculate, well, maybe it's a multiverse or some other kind of physics. And so there's a lot of speculation going on about this initial Big Bang, all right? But it, it's not simply this, okay? I just put not a good candidate, in my opinion. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going against a big-time physicist there with Lawrence Krauss, but I'm not convinced. <clears throat> so let's set the original data point aside and talk about the expansion of the universe. This is also strange. We have dark energy that's causing the expansion rate to accelerate, and it's not expanding too fast because of, of dark matter. Now, some dark matter is just... I mean, dark matter is matter that doesn't interact with light. We already know some of that matter. We know neutrons. So neutrons aren't charged. And so how are you going to get a neutron, a non-charged particle, to interact with light? It's just like a, a, a diatomic molecule that does not have a permanent dipole moment. It's not going to interact in the rotational mode with light. It might have a vibration, but it's not going to have a rotational mode. So there are certain things, forbidden modes in benzene. You just looked at a lot of those. Those forbidden modes in benzene are dark modes. They don't have any way of interacting with light. So you shouldn't think that dark matter is, is um, overly mysterious, okay? It's just, and so how do we determine if it's there or not? Well, we're looking at the expansion rate of the universe. We're looking at, at gravity. So remember, <laughs> this was actually in Star Wars uh, when they're looking for the planet and they're like, oh, how embarrassing. You know, Yoda says, Obi-Wan has lost the planet, you know? <laughs> and so then the kids, he says, the gravity is responding as if there's a planet there, but there's no planet there. And the little kid says, well, go to the source of the gravity and you'll find the planet, you know, and, and sure enough, that's true. Well, that's, we're kind of using that with dark matter. We're saying that the gravity is such that there's more matter out there than we can see that's emitting light. So that's dark matter. But if we just had dark matter, the universe would collapse in on itself. So it would be going this way and getting smaller over time. And so we have also more energy in that dark matter, dark energy are fine-tuned to give us the expansion rate that we have now. <clears throat> so let's look at how we, how we know this stuff. Well, we've got these emission lines in stellar spectra. So this cosmological redshift. And so let's talk about this sodium line. And if we look in space, 
we see that that sodium line, which is characterized by a doublet, so we recognize that doublet. And we look in the spectrum of a star and it's no longer at 589 nanometers, it's shifted. It's now at 591. Now, could it be another element? Well, we can look on Earth for other elements that have a doublet at 591 and 592. We don't know, we don't know of any, we don't find any. So unless this star has a totally different periodic table, that's one, one theory. But we look at, it's got all the other lines. It's got hydrogen lines, it's got oxygen lines, it's got iron lines, and they are all shifted by the same amount. So it's probably not a whole new periodic table. It's probably something called the Doppler effect. And so if that star is moving away from us, so if we, are, if we have two fixed positions and light's coming at us like this, Right, we, ex we experience that light, we get its, its frequency, and we can calculate its wavelength, C over lambda, and we can calculate the wavelength, okay? If we're moving away from each other, so, so now we have uh, light that's been emitted, but we're moving away from each other we will experience that oscillation in a slower manner because um, it'll be passing our detector, you know, as the detector is moving away and it will be at a slower manner. You've, you've maybe heard an ambulance go by or a train go by and when it passes you, you hear it go to a lower frequency, you know, like I'll do a train, you know, it's coming along and it goes, yeah. And that nah, is a red shift of the sound. It's shifting to a longer wavelength of sound. Same thing happens with light. And so we could look at that. We could say the observed wavelength minus the earth wavelength divided by the earth wavelength. So we're kind of getting a percent change, right? We can multiply that by 100% and get the percent change in wavelength. <clears throat> we call that Z, this cosmological redshift factor. And for this particular example, that's 0 0.004749. And this allows us to calculate that Doppler shift, the velocity of expansion. So we multiply that shift by C and we get the velocity of expansion. Not the frequency of, uh, of the light, but the velocity of expansion. So this would be the speed at which that source and our detector are moving apart from each other. And they are fast. Look at that, kilometers per second. <laughs> That's moving. Right. To get that much of a shift, we're moving apart at, at, at 0 0.004 uh, you know, times the speed of light. So it ends up being at roughly you know, kilometers per second. So we're moving apart at 1425 kilometers per second, that source in our detector. And so uh, Hubble, who the Hubble telescope was named after, looked at trying to get an idea of the, the size of the universe and how far the stars were. Um, have you ever used, um, well, just think about, about this particular case. When you're, um, put, put your finger in, in front of your face and, and look at it. And, and then look with your peripheral vision, you see there's two of me, right? You look at your finger, you see two of me. You see that? And then when you focus on me, there's two fingers. So you see that? You ever, you ever play around with this? What you're looking at is called parallax, okay? And I could take the distance, like I could look at this and see the two of you, and then I could look at you and see the two fingers, and I could use the equations to figure out how far you are from me. So using parallax, we can get distances that are moderately close to us. There's also a fun one too. You can put your fingers like this and look at the far wall, and you pull them apart a little bit, and there's a little sausage suspended between your fingers. <laughs> you ever do it? Just pull them apart. You don't have to put it too close to your eye, but about, you know, and pull it apart. Just pull it apart a little bit. Can we see that? It's fun with parallax. That's great for little kids. Anyway, so, <clears throat> so we could use parallax to understand at least our near range uh, galaxy. 
And so here's the sun, here's the earth. And we take a picture of this sky in the spring. So spring. Then we go through the summer and then we get to fall. And we take a picture of the galaxy in that direction. And look at that, we now have two eyeballs that are separated by a long distance, the whole orbit of the Earth. And that's great, that's great for parallax. And so we can look at those two images and they don't line up until you give them the depth. And it's just like a stereo image that you have if you ever play around with stereo images. When you put an image in each eye, your brain says these things don't line up unless I make them 3D. And that's how your 3D goggles work or glasses work. You have an individual image for each eye and your brain is doing the work. That's why if you work with VR a lot, you get a headache sometimes. Those, the inner you know, pupil distance has to be just perfect and all, all that. But even then your, your CPU up here is adding that Z depth, that, that depth. And, and it's working over time because it's getting two flat images and creating the depth up here. Uh, so we could do that same thing with fall and spring images or winter and summer images and so on uh, from Earth. And then we can find the distances. So the near distances, meaning around our galaxy and so on, they match uh, the parallax image. We can look at those. We can look at the redshift. And we can say, yeah, absolutely. This redshift is telling us accurately what these distances are. And then we can take those near distances and we can say, these are some suns that are similar or stars similar to ours that have a, a similar chemical composition. And we can look at their brightness. Since they have the same age as our sun, they're about the same brightness as our sun, but we look at, at their brightness we know their distances and we can see this relationship that the dimmer stars are farther away and the brighter stars are nearby. Now that's how we get away from the parallax thing because the far stars, we can't use parallax, but we can use brightness. And so here's the brightness uh, deal. And then we've correlated that to the redshift and the, the distance. So the distance uh, from brightness, the redshift from the atomic spectra, and we get this nice linear relationship. Now, what's up with this cluster here? Okay, thank you if you'll get that door back there, or this one. Why is all of this cluster off of the line? It's because those stars are in a galaxy that's rotating towards and away from us. And so not only are we getting the, the expansion of the universe, but we're seeing the velocity of rotation in that galaxy. And so we can explain a lot of these deviations from this brightness distance to redshift curve. And these are huge distances. These are megaparsecs. So one megaparsec is uh, 3.26 3 times 10 to the sixth, or 3.6 million light years. And then this allowed this, this fit to come up with the Hubble constant. So 70.4 kilometers per second per million megaparsec. So so now we can get the distance from our redshift. So if we have our redshift value, the observed wavelength, the Earth wavelength, we know the speed of light, that's a constant, Hubble's constant, we can get the distance. So we can go in our spectrometer, look at the distant star, see where the sodium line is, compare it to other lines too, and we can know how far away that star is. It's just really cool. So let's practice, let's do an example calculation. So what would be the observed wavelength of the 589.6 nanometer line from a star 20 megaparsecs away? So, you know, this star right here, where would, where would the sodium line show up for that star? So we can solve for this whole equation. Let's solve for the Earth wavelength, or solve for the observed wavelength. We know all of the constants on the left. We know the distance, 20 megaparsecs. We know the Hubble constant, speed of light. And we know the Earth wavelength, which is 589.6. So here's our calculation, and it'll be 592. So still in the visible region, very easy to make this measurement, 592.4 nanometers. So that's that's how that's um, that's where that uh, wavelength would show up. Now this is a fun one. We 
are measuring distances in light years, and we know how far light travels in a year. So how far away and when did that light come from, uh, leave that star? So this 20 megaparsecs is 65 million years ago. So this is how many light years? It's a million light years. We have 20 of those. So that's 65 million years ago. That, and that's so strange to think about. The light hitting our eye from that star is telling us what that star looked like 65 million years ago. We do not know what that star looks like today. So when you're looking through the telescope, you're looking into the past. It's so strange to think about. You know, the, the, the universe outside of that, you know, I mean, it's it could be drastically different. I mean, we see the development of stars and galaxies and so on, but the further back we look, further away we look in, in distance, the further back we look in time. And so that's just always been one that kind of breaks my brain. How many meters away is this? Well, we could take that. We've got this, the speed of light here, which gives us meters per second. So let's get out of years into days, out of days into hours, out of hours into seconds, and then seconds to meters using the speed of light. So it's about a mole of meters, okay, uh, which is 610,000 exameters. That's 10 to the 18 which is the largest prefix I know. So it's even larger than the largest metric prefix that I know. So let's think about this. Um, let's pretend this is our galaxy. So we're here somewhere, right? Like on a map, you, I won't say R, I'll say might be. Okay, and let's say that 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 star we looked at, when we look back in the past, we see it maybe right there. Okay, so that's the star we're looking at. But we're looking back 65 million years ago. So it it emitted that light towards, you know, an Earth that was 65 million years younger. <laughs> okay, and it took that long for that light. So I'm just showing you the little progression that light cruising our way, and finally it hits us in that spiral arm of our galaxy. So it's interesting. And when we look at that star, we're looking at, at it here. Okay. And if we look at something further than that, we're looking at it here. And if we're looking at something further than that, we're looking at it there. So any questions about this? This has got to be something that's twisting your brain. I know it twists mine, or maybe I'm just dumb. <laughs> Are you glad I put this stuff in here? Yeah. How do we know this? Well, we know this because of the, um, well, this is a great video. Um, we, we know this because of spin orbit coupling. Then, you know, this, it's possible, I guess, that physics could be dramatically different and that this model is, is bunk, okay? Um, you know, just like how you look underwater and you're looking at a fish, but because of the way the water steers light, the fish isn't where you think it is, okay? So that kind of parallax with water and so on, you know, and that might be happening here but it just doesn't seem like we would have drastically different physics because the, the thing that convinces me is the spin orbit coupling. We don't see, as we look back further and further at stars, the sodium doublet is still the sodium doublet. And it's still in the same relative position to the hydrogen spectral lines and the iron spectral lines. And all of these spin orbit couplings, these little doublets and triplets and the magnesium triplet and so on, they are all sliding with each other. And there's no spot where we're like, okay, this beyond say 50,000 years, we see dramatic shift in these lines. We don't see that. We see a really smooth progression of these red shifts the further out we look. Okay. And so we can basically say this, this, this Bohr magneton and the, the spin of the electron, the spin of the nucleus, all of those kinds of physical constants appear to be static um, going back in time. 
So this uh, splitting and the relative intensities haven't changed the spectra of any of the ancient stars. And so I think that that's uh, pretty good evidence that, that the universe is ancient, but we still don't know what happened with that original inflationary model. Like the, what, that, that is faster than the speed of light. So that if you were to categorize natural phenomena, what, how, would you, how would you describe a natural phenomenon? If you're in the lab, you're mixing something together and you see a color change or whatever, how would you, how would you know that that was a natural phenomenon and not some little, I don't know, being alien, or whatever, messing with your experiment? How would you describe it? How would you make the case that it was a natural phenomenon? Well, yeah, but what, let's move out of your description of it. How, okay, let's take that. You visually saw it, but what would you describe? You probably wouldn't describe your feelings, right? You'd start using sciencey things. What kind of sciencey things would you use to describe that phenomenon? What are we studying in this course? What? Yeah, ideas of atoms, electrons, energy levels, energy lines, transitions. What is all buried in all of those things? Things like the speed of light, right? Things like the charge, the, the elemental charge on an electron, the physical quantities that we that we have, right? So we would we would say if if we look at it and say, yeah, the charge on the electron, the speed of light, all of that explains what I just saw. Then I'm making a case that what I just saw was a natural, right? A natural phenomenon. So the speed of light, the charge on the electron, when we say something was natural, a natural phenomenon, that's what we're talking about. So what would you call something that broke those rules? Unnatural, <laughs> right? So when something goes faster than the speed of light, and that's in your theory, that becomes an unnatural theory, a non-natural theory, a supernatural theory. Something about that initial expansion is not natural. And so they know that. Physicists know that. That's why they're speculating about multiverses and all kinds of things. And so that's that's where we are. So after that initial expansion, hey, we're good. Speed of light, so the cosmic speed limit, you know, charges on the electrons haven't changed and so on. But what happened at that initial expansion is up for grabs. So enjoy chewing on that. <laughs> All right. So y'all have a great day.